and Larson's here for number four. Henrik Larson drives another nail into Rangers' coffin. Mr. Moranti gets the return pass against McDonald, drives in the shot, cracks off the ball. Larson tries to get the rebound, and the ball's in the net! And that's number two. Celtic, two goals inside three minutes. United gave it away. Henrik Larsson with the aid of a deflection. The green and white ribbons can go in the cup now. Henrik Larsson versus Colgan. Takes his time and scores! Wide of the keeper's left hand. Henrik Larsson second. Celtic's third. Celtic will be the Scottish Cup winner. Lennon through to Lambert, driving to the goal line. Cutting it back again. Larsson! Oh, so simple from Henrik Larsson. His 100th SPL goal. His 11th hat trick for Celtic. Celtic worthy champions. Prince of goal scorers, Henrik Larsson. Tell us about your job here, Henrik. Um, your coaching philosophy, the way you like your players to play the game. Is there, and who are the of the coaches, the great coaches that you have played under? Have you what have you learned from them that you're implementing here? No, but in all the teams I've played, I've been playing in in passing uh, teams that like to to keep the ball, have possession, and attack. Uh, yeah, both from the wings and centrally. Uh, so I mean, that's that's the f- philosophy I got. But at the same time, you shouldn't underestimate the, the long ball because that can be efficient sometimes as well. But coming to the coaches that I had in my career, I mean, I think I took something from everybody, uh, even the, the the coaches that I didn't particularly like, uh, liked, you say. Uh, I took things from them as well. So it's something that I try to 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 make my own my own and fit into my mold and how how I am as a person because I think as a leader you have to be uh, yeah both sincere but also uh, you have to lead by example and if you have something that doesn't fit your personality uh, I think that the players see right through you from the beginning you think you think players can can sense a coach who's maybe bluffing yeah can. Do you do you miss do you miss playing? No, not really, not really, because I can't play on the level I I want to play. So I still play with the first amateur team here. Uh, the guys over 35. We have a league once a week, and that's enough for me. So you can you can still mix it uh, on that level without a doubt. But here, no. <laughs> Are you a kind of frustrated? manager in a sense Henrik because you scale such heights in the world game and you, you're now dealing with a level of player who are, who are obviously a, a aspiring to reach the heights that you get you got to but is that frustrating that you're that you're not operating at the, at the highest level now no not really I mean you have to adapt to the situation you have to understand where they are I mean when I was their age I wasn't as good as I was when I played in Scotland. So it's always a question of developing as a, both as a person but uh, as a football player. And I think that uh, you can't be frustrated. I mean, I have to, how do you say, lower the bar a little bit uh, in order to uh, make sure they understand what I want to do. To do. Uh, and uh, yeah, in order to do that, you have to realize that as quick as possible. And I've been in this work now uh, for, I think it's, five, six years now and uh, so far I haven't been at the club that is even close to the standards that I was used to play as a football player so you have to lower the bar but at the same time you have to aspire and have ambitions to to try to make the players uh, as close as possible to the level that I was as a player myself. Because Roy Keane used, used to say that at early in his management days he found it hard to adapt because he got frustrated with players who couldn't do the things that he had used to doing or seeing on the football pitch. Did you ever? Did you never had a problem in adapting like that? No, I think I realised it quite quickly that uh, it wasn't possible for my first team that I had here in Sweden, Lance Krona, to play the way that Barcelona played. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, we could do some of some of the parts well, but we missed a lot of uh, quality in the in in the skill area and. If you don't have those skills and you don't have the the view of the game, uh, it's hard to play that way. So uh, I I found that out that quite quite quickly and uh, and realized that I have to adapt to the situation. Do you miss Glasgow at all? Uh, miss Glasgow, I miss Celtic, uh, but I mean uh, I wasn't that often in Glasgow. I mean I stayed out in Bothwell and 
Uh, only time I went into the city was when I was going for a restaurant or I was uh, going to buy a suit or something like that. So um, the rest of the time I was either training or I was resting. Um, what do you miss about Celtic then? I miss the fans, of course. I mean, we had a special, we have a special relationship, and uh, but I also miss the, the people around the club. Uh, even though uh, is I don't think there is. There aren't any players there still, I think, since the day I played. Uh, but the, the the staff around, uh, like John Clark, for example, or uh, Angie, who was doing the wash, the, the, the clothes yeah. for us, uh, I miss those uh, kind of people. I don't know if Hayes is still there, the groundsman, but um, those are the things that you miss. Uh, but, I mean, Glasgow was fantastic. Uh, Scotland was great. The weather wasn't the best, but I knew that when I came there, so for me it wasn't a surprise. Uh, so I never really moaned about it, I just got on with it and uh, I loved playing football and I played a lot of football there. And I um, had a great uh, uh, relationship with, uh, with, the, with the club. I have a good relationship with the club. The relationship with the fans lives on. I think long after you're gone, Henrik, the, the, the fans are going to still revere you. It's a very powerful thing, it's still I go there you know, every week or every second week watching Celtic play. Your name is still all around the stadium, people selling shirts and posters and stuff. It's it, Does that surprise you? Does it gladden your heart that your memories now is as fresh in their minds as it ever was? Of course, I'm very proud of that. I'm very happy about that because uh, it's not easy to please the crowd there. So uh, I'm very uh, proud and uh, happy about the whole situation. It's, it's good to hear. I didn't uh, expect anything else because they they always been loyal towards me and I think they appreciated the way I was loyal towards them. Um, it's no secret that I had opportunity to to leave the club earlier, uh, but uh, I loved it there and I came from a tough period in in Holland and uh, to be honest, I made made my name when I was playing in Scotland. That's where I became the player that I was until the day I finished playing football. The, the, the chances you had to leave, and obviously Man United were constantly at you, and other clubs too. Why did you stay? And was that linked to, f to, to your experience in Holland, the fact that that didn't go well and you finally found a home? Yeah, I don't think I need to answer that question because you've done it yourself. Because I was in Holland for three and a half years and um, outside the pitch I was extremely happy. Uh, but on the pitch I wasn't happy because I didn't understand the system completely. Uh, I didn't have the the coach didn't really believe in me. Um, but when I came to to Scotland, things were starting to progress again, and uh, I was starting to feel and look like the player I was here before I went to Feyenoord. So um, yeah, that's that's very much the reason why I didn't want to go because I appreciate playing week in week out. Celtic was playing in in the European League. Uh, and in the end, in the Champions League as well. So I was never interested in going down south and maybe earning a little bit more money because I had a good contract at Celtic. So no, no regrets about taking up any of the offers that you were no. made? No, no, no regrets about that at all. Really? Wow. How can I regret that? I mean, uh, the career I had at Celtic, the, the amount of goals and assists uh, and the relationship with the fans and with the club, can't regret that. That's something I, I'm going to cherish as long as I live. Let's talk about memories. Your first game for Celtic, what do you remember? I was away against Hibs and I made uh, Schick a very, very uh, good assist on his goal and they won the game. Boyd nods it down, Larson picks up, gives it away. Schick Charlie, 25 yards from goal! The left foot finds the bottom corner of the net. He had the crossbar earlier with a staggering shot. That was absolute pass from Chick Charlie, and with just 15 minutes to go, Hibernian 2, Celtic 1. So it wasn't uh, the best start, but I hold my hands up afterwards the game. I said, it's my fault, shouldn't happen. And then, uh, yeah, the rest is history. The, after those first few games, the Celtic fans weren't convinced, were they? No, I don't think they were convinced with anything. We were, I think we were seven new players at the time, and uh, Wim Janssen was the new coach, and uh, yeah. They weren't too pleased. Uh, I think we lost the first one, we drew, or did we lose the second one against Dunfermline at home as well? I don't remember, but anyway, we didn't have the greatest start, but 
in the end, I think they're, they're all very happy. I, I think I think we can we can take that as red. Yeah. Was there one match, Henrik, when you thought, okay, uh, the relationship has changed now. I've won the fans over. Was there one day in particular? I you think thought? it was away against St Johnston yeah. when uh, Darren Jackson crossed the ball for me and I made a diving header. Here comes Henrik Larson again. Works the ball out to the right hand side and Simon Donnelly lays it inside quickly to Larson. That's a good diving header and Henrik Larson has put Celtic ahead at McDermott Park after 44 minutes. St Johnson nil, Celtic won. I think that was the day they thought, well, this guy can play. Yeah. That was a good day. Yeah. You had a few? Oh, I had very many there. What what was the greatest day? The greatest day, I have to say, was when we stopped Rangers winning 10 in a row in my first season. Larson coming in from the left-hand side, thinking of a right-foot shot, and then shoots and beats me! Celtic have scored after two and a half minutes! Henrik Larson gobbled the ball about 25 yards out to the left-hand side. There's seen no danger. The St. Johnson defence backed off. He carried on. And then a sweeping right-foot shot into Maine's top left-hand corner. Celtic are off to a flyer. And Celtic Park absolutely alight. Henrik Larson, the Swede. Celtic won, St. Johnston nil. Celtic are champions. Kenny Clark, Bissell has gone. Celtic celebrate. It is an astonishing sight here at Celtic Park. They have won the Scottish League Championship title for the 36th time. This is the one that they wanted so much. What was the score at Celtic? 2-0? 2-0 at Celtic. Um, I congratulate Celtic Football Club. Um, we fought very, very hard right to end. But I congratulate Wim Janssen and his men. Uh, but that would be unfair to the, the treble we had there as well. So I had many good good memories from uh, from Scotland. Was it the fact of winning the league or stopping Rangers winning the league? I think it was a mixed uh, bit of both. Uh, at the time, you didn't, I didn't really understand how big Celtic are and uh, what it meant for the fans to, to stop them from winning 10 in a row. Uh, so it was a mix. Who kind of informed you? Who helped kind of enlighten you as to this? No, but I mean, you had you, you had Tom Boyd, who was the team captain, and he talked to us, and, and the players had been there for a while. Stubbs was there as well. Uh, but I mean, you don't really understand it until you've been living there for a few years, and uh, you start to realize what it means to the people and, uh, from the Celtic side. Is that inspirational, but it, was it also add pressure? It's pressure. I mean, they always talk about the goldfish bowl, and I didn't understand that in the beginning, but <laughs> in the end, uh, yeah, I understood it. So it adds some pressure, but that's something you have to be able to handle. If you can't handle that, you shouldn't be on that level. Celtic in the famous green and white hoops, the home side in terms of the order of batting. In their hoops, they will defend the goal away to our left. They will try to get to the goal to our right. In the blue and white stripes, it is Porto who take the kickoff. Obviously, Celtic fans revel in Seville, the run to Seville. They remember it as glory, even though it didn't end in victory or a trophy. How do you remember Seville? I'm not happy at all. <laughs> uh, I'd rather have not scored the two goals and we won the game. Uh, but uh, no, it's not a happy memory, but I learned to live with it now. And I think that it helped a little bit that that we managed to win the Champions League with Barcelona. Did, how long did it take you to get over Seville? Oh, it was a long time. We're talking years. We're talking years? years, yeah. Why? Because you shouldn't lose that game. We're scoring two goals against Porto, and I don't think you should lose that game. Driving it in, looking for Larson again! Another goal! Another wonderful header from Henrik Larson. Make that 201! Great corner by Alan Thompson. Celtic have twice come from behind in the second half. And now it's again, unbelievably, Celtic 2. Porto Heading into extra time, and it is a fantastic rendition of You'll Never Walk Alone around the Stadio Olimpico in Seville. Thousands and thousands and thousands of green and white flags and scars being held up. It's an occasion, it's a night to remember. Well, we come forward again, good ball through the middle, great run made by Marco Ferreira. Out goes Rab Douglas, they don't know where it's gone, in goes Delhi. Celtic are cruelly exposed, the ball's in the net, and Delhi has scored the goal that he believes will win the cup for Porto. Will that be the silver goal? Certainly it is hard on Celtic, 10-man Celtic. It is Celtic 2, 
4-3. The man who opened the scoring deadly has perhaps finished off Celtic. Celtic 2, Porto 3. But they were they were proved themselves to be a great yeah, team. I mean, they won the Champions League the year, the year after. So there was a very good side, but I still I think we had them there. We had them. That's really interesting and that's the mindset of a winner that you can take kind of comfort from the fact that you got to the final, you competed well, but because you didn't win, you don't see it as a success. I mean, in hindsight, of course, it's a great success uh, because it's uh, Celtic, Scottish uh, Football League, going to uh, yeah the second biggest tournament for uh, club teams. So it's a great success. But, of course, I would love to win that instead of uh, sitting here talking about the silver medal. But... Um, yeah, it was a great success, yes, but I'd rather won it than, than lose the final. The players put absolutely everything into the game, everything indeed. Couldn't ask for any more, we come roaring back each time that they scored a goal. And honestly, I fancied it if we had the 11 men at extra time. I thought, I thought we were mentally the stronger side at that stage. It wasn't to be. Uh, tell me about Martin O'Neill and his and his influence on on you and what you what you learned from him. No, but I think it, when he when he came in, you saw uh, saw a leader that was quite clear in what he wanted to achieve. He had the money at the time as well, so we had a very good side. Um, and I mean the passion for the game, uh, never settling for anything, never settling for second best. And he also. Uh, uh, stabilize things at Celtic b- because before that has been uh, had been a lot of changing in the in the in the coaches there. Uh, so it was very good. He came and uh, settled all the things down. A great manager. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, he um, yeah, very good. He had a great staff around him as well, both in Robo and Wally. So they really worked well together. Um, how was your relationship? With him, I mean, did did you were you close? Close. What yeah, do you mean close? Uh, did we go for a did lunch you or dinner? Yeah. No, no, we didn't. No. Uh, but I think we appreciated each other. Uh, I know we appreciated. I can't even speak English anymore. Appreciated each other um, because uh, yeah, I helped him and he helped me in my career and uh, he uh, came to visit when I played in Barcelona and. Whenever we see each other, it's, it's great memories. But it's with all of the players and the coaching staff uh, from those years, because what, we had, we share so much together. Yeah. What was special about him in those years? No, but I think, as I said, he never settled for second best. He wasn't happy if we we lost, which we rarely did under him. But once we did it, uh, he wasn't pleased. Uh, he always always demanded 100% from his players, uh, and. Um, yeah, if you didn't do it the way he wanted, he'd let you know. Do you keep in touch with Celtic? Do you know what's going on at Celtic? Uh, I don't have the the inside line anymore. Uh, I used to have that with Neil and Johan when they were there. <laughs> then I knew a lot. Uh, but now it's a little bit more difficult. But, um, yeah... They've done their business. They won the league, and that's the most important thing. Mm. Do you watch? Do you ever watch them? Do you ever? Do you ever go they back? Don't, they don't know. I don't go because I don't have time, and they don't really very often show the games in from from the Scottish league here uh, anymore. Uh, they showed the the cup final. They showed when Celtic won, uh, but otherwise it doesn't. The Swedish television doesn't prioritise the Scottish league. I guess it's hard to stay in touch then with, with what's going on, and you've got your hands full here anyway. Yeah, I got <laughs> I got enough on my plate here. There was an awful lot of talk last summer that you were possibly going to be the Celtic manager. Was there any? any was that was just newspaper talk, or was there any substance in that at all? There was a lot of substance in, in that, um, but I th- still feel that uh, I wasn't ready for it. Uh, and the circumstances wasn't the right ones. I think that today you uh, underestimate the importance of the job at Celtic uh, Football Club. That's the day when you fail. Mm. And I've seen a few coaches doing that, and um, 
and that's why they didn't get any results either. Were you tempted? Of course, I'm, I, I was tempted. Uh, but at the same time, I had uh, signed a one-year deal with uh, Falkenberg at the time, and it wasn't the time to, to leave them. Did they did they offer you a job? Did you talk to them at the time? Did you? Uh, we had a chat and leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. So no re- no no regrets because it's a massive. You're a young coach. I feel that it wasn't the timing wasn't right. Uh, not for me. Not for the family. Yeah, yeah. But you would never rule it out. No, I think as long as I'm in this line of work, there's always uh, I'm always going to be mentioned when when uh, when Celtic is looking for a new coach. Manage. I presume because you scaled the heights, the great heights as a footballer, you'll want to do the same as a manager. Yeah, you're 100 percent right in that one. Um, I want to uh, go out to the to the big leagues in Europe again, um, experience the European nights. Uh, but at the same time, I'm very happy here. I'm pleased here. Uh, I'm 100 uh, percent focused here. I know that we are in a tough sh- challenge at the moment in rebuilding a stadium, rebuilding a team, uh, rebuilding the economy. Um, so I half seriously, half jokingly say to the people here that I'm here to stabilize, sanitize and leave it oh, leave it to somebody else. <laughs> How many years of a project is this, do you think? Between the stadium no, I and signed the... a three-year yeah. deal here and the, and the stadium is going to stand ready on in... in uh, 17 so uh, yeah if I'm fortunate enough to be here that long yeah it's going to be great did they understand patience here yeah. the fans the people no I think it's uh, that's why I wanted this job as well because this this club means a lot uh, to the people in the city mm. uh, this love hate relationship towards the club and uh, is there really why is that why the no, hate but I'm going to answer your question yeah. first uh, the patience yeah for the first five six games is always there and then then it's not there anymore um, because this is the biggest club in the in the city and uh, there's a lot of smaller clubs around that uh, in the past maybe felt that they weren't treated right by this club but uh, that's that's something that we're looking to change Messi again and he gets his fourth goal fantastic now for Lionel Messi, Barcelona 4, Arsenal 1. What can you say about Messi? Let's go on to the next chapter of your life, which was at, at Barcelona. Lionel Messi's debut was against Espanyol, October the 16th, 2004. And you played with him that day. He played with me. Just excuse me, I beg your pardon. He no, played. I'm just joking. <laughs> That's what I say to everybody when they say, how was it to play with Ronaldinho and... Uh, and Messi and Xavi and uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, Wayne Rooney, said they played with me. I'm older than them. <laughs> it, he came on as a sub for um, for Deco, yeah. which left against poor old Espanyol, which left an attacking unit of Larson, Ronaldinho, Eto, and Messi, which isn't bad. Oh, um, it's, it's all right. What was the young Messi like? No, but you could see straight away that he was a talent. Um, he wasn't the player that he is today. But he was very good. I mean, even then you saw the close control of the ball he had in, in high speed, and the things he could do. And and then obviously becoming older, he uh, made it more more and better all the time. And uh, he was, yeah, it was it's kind of uh, yeah scary when I look back and I look at the players that played with me or I played with them is some decent players there. Well, you played with, uh, of, of this generation, you played with, with some of the, with most of the, the all-time greats. I mean, and in your third game for Barcelona, I think it was your third game, you, you went back to Celtic. Oh, I was sitting at the pool uh, back in my house in Spain and in Barcelona and um, Magnus Edman called me because I knew it was the, the draw for the Champions League and um, he called me. Uh, guess what? Yeah, I knew it. I didn't want to come back that early. It was too early to come back because I barely left and then boom, straight away I had to go back. So, uh, And I knew it, it would be difficult to come back. Uh, yeah, I left and all the emotion I displayed when I left, uh, I could have waited a little bit longer, but 
He finished good for me, so that's all right. Alan Thompson turns it back, and Henrik Larsson kills it on the chest and turns it into the net. The flag has stayed down. You wonder about handball, and the king returns to haunt Celtic at paradise. It is Celtic 1, Barcelona 3. You were on the bench, and you came off the bench and obviously scored. Did did you want to play? Did you want to come off the bench, or would you have rather just to stay on the bench and not have to score against your old team? No, I mean I'm professional. I was a professional football player. I, I was disappointed that I didn't play, hmm. um, but I just had a funny, funny feeling that day. I mean, if I'm on getting on the the pitch, I'm going to score because I always score at Celtic Park. So uh, and it's. That you see as well, I knew straight away Alan Thompson when he went up for that header. I knew straight away what he was going to do. So I, I went for it and uh, I beat Marshy before it and then put it in the empty net. And yeah, it wasn't fair because I trained so much with Tomo and uh, I knew what he was <laughs> going to do. So uh, it was a funny feeling scoring the goal, but of course. I was happy because I got a new club that I was at, uh, but at the same time I, I felt a little bit uh, was mixed emotions because I, I have a, and I had a, such a great relationship with the fans. Um, so it, yeah, it was a sour moment, but at the same time I was pleased. Was it of all the all the many 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 goals that you scored? Was it the strangest? Yeah, it was the strangest without a doubt because I remember it, the si- silence. And then I think it came some applause after that. Yeah. So they kind of, it obviously, it didn't, it didn't embitter the Celtic fans towards you. They just, I guess it was another illustration of your greatness. No, oh, but I think that everybody at Celtic knew uh, I was a good player. And if I get, get on the pitch, there's a, there's a big chance that I would score a goal. Uh, so uh, I don't think they were surprised when the ball was ended up in the net. But I think they were also a little bit, should we share or should we not? So that's why the silence, because before everybody made up their mind. And I suppose, did you have the same feeling? Should I cheer or should I not? No, I, as soon as I uh, scored a goal, I, I would knew that I wouldn't celebrate uh, because that would be a lack of respect. Did you plan, did you know, did you tell yourself that beforehand? If I score, I'm not going to celebrate? No, or was it just I didn't. Instant? It was just uh, when, as soon as I scored a goal, boom. Yeah. No celebration. The Champions League final, which is obviously the high the high point yeah. of your time at Barcelona. Um, incredible appearance off the bench. A historic um, two assists, two goals, 2-1. Two, and you were sitting on the bench with Xavi and Iniesta. Again, we're talking about greatness. My goodness. What was, what was that night like for you? I was annoyed I didn't play. Uh, but I made my mind up that I wouldn't uh, lose the second big final. And I also made my mind up straight away when I knew that I wasn't playing, that I wasn't going to sulk. I'm going to treat the game as professionally as I could to look at the... Yeah, I mean, obviously I knew if I would come in on the pitch, I would be either number nine or on the on the wing. So I looked at the defenders, even though I played Sol Campbell and Ture before and Ashley Cole. And uh, on the right back was, uh, don't remember, but I played them before. Uh, so I, but I was just looking at the game and I, I, I wanted to make an impact if I came on the pitch. So, so did you, before you came on, did you know exactly where the weaknesses were in the Arsenal defence? No, I wouldn't say that I knew exactly, but I knew that uh, they wouldn't like my movement yeah. because that was something I could do when I played football. I could move and make it difficult for the defenders to know where I was. Yeah, because you created one on the left and then one on the right. You were, you were obviously moving about it. They couldn't pick yeah, you up. Yeah, no, but I think that's what we lacked a little bit when uh, when we were one man more than them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we didn't have anybody to cross the ball for, but when I came on, they obviously had uh, somebody to cross the ball for. Uh, but to move and try to create space, not may- for myself, maybe to get the goal, but... Uh, create space for others. The famous interview that Thierry Henry did on the pitch afterwards, you remember this? When he said, I didn't see Ronaldinho out there. Um, I didn't see Eto out there. I saw Henrik Larsson out there. Yeah, he obviously was very pissed at them because he was competing with them uh, about the Ballon d'Or, I think it was. 
no, but I think that it means a lot for me when it comes from a player of his uh, caliber that uh, he um, he saw that that I made a difference coming from the bench. Mm. So that's obviously very pleasing to hear because I think he's one of the greatest strikers ever played this game. Um, was Seville in your mind? You mentioned you didn't you didn't want to lose a second of European course, final. Yeah, of yeah. course it was. I mean, I've been on the losing end in a big final, and uh, it wasn't a pleasing experience. And I knew it took me a lot of years to get over the the loss in Seville, and I didn't want to. Because you know you're going to watch football in uh, yeah all your life, and you're going to watch the Champions League. So whenever I want to watch the Euro League, I don't have a great feeling. But when I watch the Champions League, I have a great feeling because obviously managing to to, to uh, make a difference when I came on and and uh, we won the game is so much more fun. Rooney. United debut. It's Manchester United one, Aston Villa nil, and against Martin O'Neill, it just had to be Henrik Larsson. We, we talk about Man United, obviously the next stage, and there was a quote in Alex Ferguson's latest book. It said, "When you played your last game for Man United, it was against Middlesbrough, I think." This, I thought this this quote jumped out at me. He said, "When you came in, the whole dressing room stood up and applauded you." Yeah, it was a great experience having gigs there, having uh, Cristiano. Ferdinand uh, Scholes was there, uh, Rooney was there, so that was, uh, understand me right now because it was a little bit embarrassing because i only been there for 10 weeks. They obviously knew who I was, uh, they, as I watched them play, I think they watched me play sometimes as well. Uh, but when you get good players together, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's so, so much easier because you understand each other on a different level. Uh, you know, when you play a one-two, you know you're going to get it back. Uh, or you make uh, a movement, you know you're going to get the ball. I think uh, they appreciated me when I was 35 that uh, I could still move, I could still play. Uh, so I think that's the things that they appreciate, and also that in all the teams I've been, I've always been looking for the team to be number one. Yeah. Um, uh, I'd rather win a game, as I said, than, than, than score myself. What a great decision it was by Sir Alex Ferguson to bring Henrik Larsson on loan. But it was your... Uh, Ferguson kept going on about this, your professional... Not just a, your ability, which was God-given and obvious, but it was your dedication, your professionalism, your ruthless kind of dedication to doing the right things as an athlete. Yeah, no, but at the time as well, I was 35. And a lot of people said, what is he doing getting uh, him to be playing half a year in Swedish uh, highest division and he thinks he's going to be able to do something in the, in, in, in the games for Manchester. So that was a motivation factor for me as well, uh, to show them that, that I could still play at my age. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think think we showed them. And Neville and Giggs, two of the great premiership players, lift the trophy and Manchester United celebrate for the 16th time in their history. What, what kind of a fool would say that you weren't capable of playing for Man United at 35? You were. You could have kept playing for Man United another two or three years. Yeah, at least two, maybe. Uh, no, but that's, that's how it goes because it's always easier to be critical than positive about things. Uh, so it was a lot of uh, paper talk here back home in Sweden that that I was taking a big gamble but I didn't see it as a big gamble I saw it as opportunity to do something that uh, that I knew wouldn't come back um, Tell me about the young Ronaldo because it's amazing I think yourself and PK are maybe the only two players who played for pl played with Messi and Ronaldo at club level I don't know about that one but I came when I came to Manchester he was about to take that next step. Uh, I'm not saying that I may, made him take it. I think he already progressed during the season. 
but he was very close to the finish article there. Uh, he stopped with his seven step overs. Uh, he started to look at the game, scoring his, his own goals, uh, but also looking at the, his teammates. Uh, so it was a privilege to, to, to work with him and he was a true professional. He was taking care of his body, always doing extra stuff. So I'm very happy for him that he, he got and having the career that he's having now. Did you help him in a sense? I don't know. I just, I think that uh, I didn't talk uh, about uh, the game, how to do and things, but I thought he saw that in order to be able to play for a long time on this level, you need to take care of your body. You need to be dedicated to what you're doing. Uh, and maybe he, he saw something there. I don't know. That's a question you have to ask him. Who were you closest to with all those guys? The closest to was uh, Edwin van der Sar because we were about the same age. Uh, we played against each other in Holland. I speak Dutch still, so uh, it was quite easy. And Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, he is also close to my age. So that was the guys that uh, I was closest to. But I wouldn't say that I socialized a lot outside of football with them. Uh, I went to uh, van der Sar's house and his family. Uh, but otherwise, it was just a question of uh, resting the body and uh, making sure that you could train with the youngsters. But what about at, at Barcelona? Who would you have been closest to? Van Bronckhorst, without a doubt. We were neighbours. Just yeah. before I came down there, he uh, made sure that I got a house right next to him that Philip Cuckoo just left. Uh, so, without a doubt, uh, uh, Van Bronckhorst. And at Celtic? Oh, ooh, if you ask the other the guys that were there, they used to say we have had our smuggle boggle. Your what? Smuggles board. No, they, <laughs> they, they weren't too pleased. We were two from Norway, two from Denmark, two from Sweden, three at one point Swedes there. So it was Scandinavians I was uh, close to and Chris Sutton, of course. Where do you think you're at now in your coaching life, Henrik? Are you, do you think you're... Very much at the start, or still learning. I don't think that you uh, just because you've been a decent footballer that you uh, know everything. Uh, because there's different decisions that you have to make. Uh, you have to be aware of a lot of other things that you don't have to focus on when you're self playing the game. Uh, so I'm still learning, and I'm being humble in that uh, because it's. Uh, you need to learn a lot of things. You need to be able to to detect a lot of things in in the players, in their behaviors, and and also to get the best out of the players. Which buttons are you pressing on? And because they're all individuals, but you, I'm trying to make them as as a unit, and uh, that's the most important thing. Can you look at the Champions League final and kind of learn from it as a coach? Do you do you watch matches yeah, differently? Yeah, yeah, I, I watch. Uh, some games I just watch to to watch them, uh, but obviously depending on the system, I'm playing a 4-4-2 system here now at the moment. I've been trying a little bit with 3-5-2, uh, uh, so whenever there's a system that I'm not too familiar with, then I look uh, a little bit extra and see how I can implement it in, in, in my team. Um, because, yeah, if you think you know it all and you're the greatest, I don't think you're going to be very long in this game. Is it, is it a harder life as a manager than a player? Uh, I wouldn't say harder. Um, it was hard as a football player, um, but I loved it. It's hard as a manager, but I love it. Um, you would watch the Champions League final, Xavi's last game, your old club has obviously won another Champions League in great style. Um, Tell me about Xavi. He never loses a ball. He never, I've never seen him make a wrong pass. Um, it's unbelievable. I mean, um, in a in a time period when you're looking at all the central midfield players around Europe, they were about 185 and uh, 85, 90 kilos. And you come to Barcelona, you see Xavi playing against them guys, and they never catch him. It's, it's unbelievable awareness, knowing where to move the ball, in which space is going to be free. 
when am I going to use more than one or two touches? It's it's fantastic, and also the the decisive ball he can give. And Iniesta, would he be in the same bracket? Yeah, without a doubt. I think Iniesta got uh, a little bit more towards the goal than Xavi had, um, or have, because he's still playing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think he's up there or maybe just edging a little bit. Would it be possible at all to pick one guy out of the whole out of everyone you played with yeah no but if, if i'm looking the importance for the team i have to say chavi i mean making the, the the game the game plan work the way we wanted it because of his uh, vision of the whole field and his intelligence yeah just just super i mean i read stuff interviews with him and it's an education listening to him talk about about yeah, football i would love to pick his brain would you? Yeah. You st- are you in touch with it? Would you not be able to pick up the phone? Yeah, uh, I probably would, but my Spanish is not good enough. <laughs> so that's a lot of things going to be last, lost in translation there. So, uh, But, I mean, again, whenever I join up with those guys, um, yeah, the lang- language doesn't matter because we have a great history together. Have you, have you picked up the phone to any former managers, teammates, to ask them a little bit of advice And now that you've become a manager? Murder McLeod. Vim Janssen I've been talking to a lot as well. Yeah. Uh, so there's a few, yeah, without a doubt. And I know that more or less every manager I had in my career, I can pick up the phone if I want and call them and they would have time for me. Finally, so many Celtic fans would be listening to this. Uh, so many young Celtic fans Two points here. A, what message would you have for Celtic fans? And B, for young players in Scotland, what, what advice would you give them? Message to the Celtic fans is just, uh, yeah, I miss them. Uh, I enjoyed uh, the seven years we had. Uh, not always winning the league, uh, but it was a special relationship and I cherish it. And for young players, I mean, the drive for the game, if you don't have that, yeah, you won't become anything good or great. They said he did the red for Henry Larson. Celtic have scored. What a sensational goal. Listen to Parkhead. It's back to Larson with a chance. And it's a goal for Celtic. Oh, that is wonderful from Henry Larson. That was the spot that might take them all the way to the final. Henry looks at the watch on his left wrist and blows the full time whistle. Larson's final game is cut by a double that rescued Celtic this afternoon. Two goals from Henrik Larson to take his career tally to 242 and for the season to 41. It's been a great, great seven years and I could have never dreamt of anything like this when I first signed on the line here at Celtic.